Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I speak English because we have a uh, US American speaker. Um, my name is Mike Geppert. I'm professor of strategic and international management at the, at the uh, business administration and economics department. And I have the great honor to introduce uh, Professor Galbraith today, who is a professor of government at the University of Texas, Austin. And he's one of the most well-known econo economists uh, in the study of inequality, growth, um, and also um, about Europe and about the United States. He's also published uh, about Latin America and other parts, uh, parts of the world. He did his PhD in, J in Yale, um, and he has published widely. Uh, one of the most recent books uh, he has published, uh, which I um, um, can recommend, uh, which is a good read, uh, is called Welcome to the Poisoned Chalice, The Destruction of Greece and the Future uh, of Europe. Um, he published that together in his collaboration with uh, 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 Varoufakis. And he will today speak about another famous book of his, recently published, uh, The End of Normal, where he will t uh, tell us why we will struggle in the future with inequality and non-growth to a certain extent. The floor is open to you, Professor Galbraith. Thank you very much indeed. And it's a great pleasure, really, for me to be here. A privilege to be speaking at the opening of this conference. Karl Polanyi wrote The Great Transformation to describe the rise of 20th century industrial society with its benefits, challenges, and dangers. And he did it in a spirit of open-minded inquiry, unencumbered by dogma or a priori categorizations. Today we gather in his spirit to assess our century, no less fraught, no less beset. Two great specters hang over us. One is the high temperature and very rapid extinction uh, that would follow a general nuclear war, or more probably, the biological poisoning of the planet, a point made very forcefully in his day by Andrei Sakharov, that would follow a purely regional nuclear conflict somewhere in the world. This is an ever-present danger, made more likely by our indifference and complicity in the so-called modernization of warheads, in the manufacture and sale of delivery vehicles, and in the sabotage of nuclear agreements. The other great specter is a slow extinction, comparatively, by runaway global warming, comfortingly relabeled climate change, against which by far the largest effort of planning, investment, public education, and social insurance in human history will be required. The mother of all new deals. All of which, each of these things, being made more difficult and remote by economists and their fantasy schemes. For example, that the idea that developments which will have their consequences 50 and 100 years in the future, thanks to the loading of gases in the atmosphere, can be dealt with by the mechanism of markets today. An idea that was expressed to me 
some years ago by a high economist in the Obama administration in the United States, those were the good guys, relatively speaking, who uh, described it as the voice of his inner Hayek. My task and topic today are a step or two down on the scale of these existential dangers. The reason for this is that my competences are, competencies are limited. And staying within the scope of professional competence, however foolishly acquired, let me try to integrate two recent themes in my own work. One relates to economic performance in this century, the 21st century, but especially after the great financial crisis. And the other, to my very long-standing research engagement with the measure and meaning of economic inequality. I assert the relevance of these two themes, not just because I've worked on them, but because they are enabling and constraining factors for dealing with the more dramatic questions that I mentioned a minute ago. As we do what we must to disarm, defuse the threat of war on one side and to attack the issue of global warming on the other, it is still necessary, it will still be necessary, to maintain a functioning system that provides our populations, our vast populations, with a decent standard of life. Otherwise, they won't accept the great transformations that we have to propose and enact. Both of these issues, the question of economic performance and the question of inequality, bear on significant aspects of habitual economic thought. Both of them challenge the mainstream, but also in some respects the Keynesian viewpoint with which I was uh, uh, raised uh, many years ago. Mainstream economics saw in the great financial crisis an unforeseen and therefore unforeseeable shock to an otherwise healthy system. Their view, this view, was organically necessary to protect mainstream economists in power and, in, and their academic allies from the criticism that they might have seen something, said something, and done something to forestall the disaster. We cannot fault them for this. It's entirely understandable. Any other dispensation would have cast doubt on the intellectual primacy of the mainstream itself. At the time, I managed in one of my rare appearances on American television, this was the PBS News Hour, to suggest that we might apply the naval principle of command responsibility. That when the ship runs aground, the captain is removed and a board of inquiry decides later on whether he was responsible or not. Horrors. This was not well received. <laughs> the captains were reappointed at the Federal Reserve in the Treasury. One of them was brought back from Harvard to serve in the White House at the time. Of course, the unforeseen shock view 
implied the inevitability of a full recovery. The system, after all, is stable and self-equilibrating that inner Hayek once again. And the Keynesians were left in a position of relatively minor dissent that the inevitable recovery could be helped along with a bit of stimulus to speed things up. I didn't think so, I don't think so. And eventually I advanced an alternative in the book that was kindly referenced a few seconds ago, The End of Normal, which rested on four broad hypotheses, and I want to review them briefly. I would modify them to a degree in light of the experience of a decade, but only in some respects. Each of them offered reasons to anticipate that the course of economic recovery and performance would be structurally inferior going forward, that the path of growth and employment would be weaker over the decades in the aftermath of the crisis. And indeed, uh, some of what I had to say applied to the period 15 years or so, the 10 years or so before the crisis as well. The first hypothesis, which actually goes back a long way, was about an increasing real cost of resources, especially energy, and the instability that is inherent in the financialization of energy markets, in the conversion of a uh, utility whose function is to bring some of the most basic raw materials uh, to, to the uh, economies that use them into a major uh, engine of speculative destabilization. I called this the choke chain effect. The idea that when you get started on a growth path, the cost of resources is driven up uh, in part by the increasing real cost of acquiring them, but to a very large degree on a much shorter time scale by the speculative movements of investors and hoarders. In the aftermath of the crisis, my case for this proposition was undermined, I have to concede in the United States by the development of fracking for natural gas and oil, which greatly reduced the cost of those resources in the American context, at least for a time. Admittedly, at a very high environmental cost, but nevertheless, the effects on the economy in the short run uh, were noticeable. In Europe, this real cost problem remains a significant factor, and it is in part due to the commitment in this country and elsewhere to making the necessary investments for an energy transition. There's no way around this. When you invest in a more expensive way of doing things, you're going to be paying a higher cost uh, for uh, the privilege or ha for having met the duty of doing so. And perhaps the same is also true, uh, as we're seeing now in some respects, with China. The more you have to spend on energy and other resources, as a matter of arithmetic, the less you have for everything else. The second hypothesis referred to a declining general expectation of profitability in long-range investments, what Keynes in his day called the marginal efficiency of capital. Here I think both the United States and Europe have been hit with a declining share of bricks and mortar investments, and therefore a declining level of overall activity, uh, but for different reasons. <laughs> 
In the US, we have the diversion, which is caused by the enormous burden of the military on the American economy. And if you want to be persuaded of this, I invite you to come and drive on American roads, particularly if you remember what they used to be like 30 or 40 years ago. The decay, the failure to maintain uh, is palpable, and even worse, the railroads or the subway systems in places like New York and Boston. I see a few people in the audience can attest to that firsthand. This is a drain and distortion in the use of technical and engineering resources, and it's a consequence of maintaining the superstructure that required to fight endless and, and largely fruitless wars. In Europe, it's more the ideology of austerity and the decline both in public sector effort and in support for private investments. Both regions are affected by the rising role of China in the global investment mix by the fact that the initiative out there in the wider world is no longer being taken primarily by the West, although I do have to state that Germany no doubt benefited in the transition from being able to sell investment goods uh, to China. That is a phenomenon which is going to be limited, perhaps already is being limited, uh, by the learning capacity uh, of the Chinese. My third hypothesis concerned the ongoing technological revolution. In particular, the rise and spread of compact digital technologies. Notoriously, Mainstream economics can barely see these effects. In fact, I think it's fair to say that from a statistical standpoint, it can not see them at all. Even though they are visible to all of us on every street, in every shop, every office, and every home, the new technologies save labor. They displace people from office and services employment, much as automotive technologies a century ago displaced horses from transportation and agriculture. They also uh, render the flow of numerous services, information, entertainment, news, pornography, cheap, removing those things from the market economy and from the measured rate of economic growth, or at least reducing them to the status of something that's provided at a fixed cost with no extra or very little marginal cost for additional consumption. And this has an effect on the growth rate of the economy as whole. What is often overlooked as well is that in addition to saving labor and cheapening consumption, the new technologies save capital as well. And they therefore help to reduce the share of investment in spending and pro tanto in measured growth and the growth of incomes. This is not a bad thing, but it creates a disconnect between what is actually happening in our economies and societies and what economic statistics constructed decades ago, a century ago, for an entirely different purpose, are able to measure. The effects can be offset, but only by public investments or private spending. And private spending has to be fueled either by incomes or by debt. A great difference between North America and Europe is the very much greater role of debt in, in fueling consumption and activity in the United States in the last decade. Student debt, automobile debt, credit card debt, housing debt, every kind of debt. We are addicted to debt in a way which I think Europeans uh, are much less so. Uh, 
So we get the new technologies, but the benefits uh, are such that many cannot actually enjoy them uh, to the fullest extent unless we go about rebalancing the concentration of incomes and correcting the resulting inequalities that have resulted from moving a great deal of activity to sectors that are dominated by an extraordinarily small number of people and whose returns are gathered by an even smaller number. This question of inequality, a point to which I will return momentarily. Fourth, and finally, my father always taught me that somewhere in the middle of a talk you should use the word finally because it encourages the audience. I suggested that the financial collapse itself exposed structural failings in the financial system, including hypertrophy, megalomania, predatory competition, bad judgment, and massive financial fraud. The possibility of such things were denied by a mainstream economics in which the financial sector basically did not exist, was invisible, and in which fraud was ruled out because of its allegedly bad effect on reputations. In the real world, the exact opposite is true. The more fraudulent you are, the more prominent you become until you're exposed. It's well known. Every country has its uh, oligarchs of that type. But once the frauds and the megalomania and the bad judgment are exposed, they cannot be repaired absent compelling and aggressive comprehensive reforms. And this did not occur. We patched up the financial system. We kept the existing institutions. We didn't do much to change them. We left many of the same people in place. And the consequences include a pervasive mistrust and an exaggerated instability, which produces a flight to quality any time the yield curve becomes inverted, which is now happening. The ironic beneficiary of this is the United States Treasury, but we're not getting to that. It's not a reliable institution except in comparison to all the others. And we even can see, as a consequence, the rise of such reassuring, stability reinforcing, and confidence enhancing political figures as our incumbent president in the United States, Mr. Donald Trump. I'm sure you agree. That was a joke, by the way. I don't know if that came close. <laughs> the upshot is a sector that is structurally incapable of providing strategic direction. A sick man, a sectoral sick man, reminiscent of the Ottoman Empire up to 1914, or the USSR in the 1980s. That's the financial sector of global capitalism as we know it today. If these hypotheses are correct, wholly or in substantial part, and I think they are, then not only will there be no automatic return to past growth trends and employment levels, but also the simple-minded pseudo-Keynesian pump priming will prove an insufficient remedy. If you have a car and the transmission is shot, adding gas to the tank is not a sufficient cure for the problem that you have. What is needed is a comprehensive recovery of strategic direction through policy and institutional reform. Change our ideas, change the structures of our economy, and of course in the European experience that means also changing the governing structures of the European Union, and pressing uh, for, or recognizing I should say, the resource and environmental constraints 
that we face and pressing for the resources to deal with them through achieving a general relaxation of international tensions and of global rivalries. The entire basis of economic strategy as a game that nations play against each other to be the largest, to be the fastest growing, to be the richest, needs to be rethought. Alongside the permissive delegation of the planning function to global finance. The new New Deal must, like the original, begin with comprehensive financial reform. The first thing that Roosevelt did was the Emergency Banking Act of 1933. That's where we also need to begin. Now, how does this relate to inequality? I thought you'd never ask. In two ways. One is related to causes, and the other to the requirements of a proper policy. In mainstream economic thought, the causes of rising inequality have been relegated to the market mechanism, to supply and demand in labor markets, affected by demand through what is called skilled bias technological change and supply uh, through education and immigration and such issues. To challenge this view, one needs evidence. But evidence is available. Extensive work, and I'll refer you uh, to a project that I've been engaged on for more than two decades now. It's called the University of Texas Inequality Project, which I think does a pretty good job along these lines of developing a dense and consistent set of comparative measures of inequality over time and across countries. 150 countries, more than 50 years, refutes the mainstream perspective. It refutes the idea that this is the work of individual and idiosyncratic labor markets, each in its own country. What it shows instead, by a simple uh, demonstration that there exist common patterns across countries, is that what we're looking at here as my friend Kari Polanyi has also argued, that the great financialization is the principal driving force, that it works at planetary scale and has for 40 years or so, with the effects inversely related to the strength of national institutions and their capacity to resist. Just say weaker countries are affected more strongly, stronger countries are affected less strongly. Big countries can insulate themselves to a certain degree, smaller countries cannot. Rich countries do better than poor countries. In particular, economic inequality rose worldwide in waves, beginning especially around 1980 with the debt crisis of the third world, passing through the collapse of the Soviet bloc in the late 1980s and of the Soviet Union, uh, and then through the liberalizations in Asia that led up to the Asian crisis of 1997. In 2000, there came a peak in the United States and elsewhere and the situation stabilized for 10 or 15 years at least, uh, and even improved in parts of the world. And you can see this if you look at the uh, accomplishments of uh, social democratic parties in Latin America. If you, you can see this in the recovery of the Russian Federation, and you can see it even in the spreading out of economic growth and development across China all of which suggests that global macroeconomic and financial conditions <clears throat> driven by policies that were framed by big finance are the principal 
true drivers of inequality in most of the world, most of the time. It's not the only thing going on. But if you take out the effect that you can observe of this common global force, then you don't observe a general rise in inequality around the world in this period. So it's very powerful evidence that what we're seeing is the consequence of uh, conditions was made possible uh, by a prior condition of financial globalization. And if this is correct, then a very large share of present mainstream microeconomics is conceptually obsolete and redundant. The point of neoclassical micro, after all, has always been to explain and to rationalize distribution, and especially the rate of profit. And as we can see in the face of this evidence, to do that is to work to obscure the dominant forces that are actually pressing on the rate of distribution and the rate of profit. Inequalities which are generated by financial booms and the concentration of income in speculative sectors, in bubble sectors, if you like, are inherently a sign and a symptom of unsustainability. I'm concerned about sustainability at the global level for environmental reasons, for the survival of human civilization on the planet, we need to be concerned about it as well in the economic sphere because instability paralyzes our capacity to act on a long time frame against important challenges. This is exactly the phenomenon experienced in small open economies of periodic overvaluations followed by a currency collapse, which itself increases inequality dramatically and overnight. So the creation of a more stable and sustainable system entails pro tanto a reduction and control of inequalities achievable only by policies and institutions that can effectively regulate global finance. And of course, effect effectively is the key word here. I uh, remember a conversation in early 2004 uh, with uh, a man who was the commander at the time of US forces in Iraq uh, <clears throat> and visiting his alma mater, which happened to be my university. I asked him if we were training any effective Iraqi security forces who were not Kurdish. And he said, mm, you know that word effective, that's a relative term. I thought that was pretty good. The next thing I knew, I was invited to uh, speak to his uh, command structure at his base in Stuttgart uh, to explain to them why I thought the whole mission in Iraq was entirely impossible. But effective control of global finance is necessary. Also, if we in the West wish to play a role in setting strategic direction for the world economy. Otherwise, that task will be executed, thank you very much, by China. And, and other countries, perhaps, that have also managed or will manage to keep global finance at bay. Global finance knows this, which explains, in part, rising tensions with China, and so I trust to the Chinese. I speak here as a former advisor to the government of China, uh, and my one notable contribution, which came in 1995, was a conference which I think did help to persuade them that it was not a good idea to open their capital account. And finally, now this finally is for real, the last one was just a wake you up. Strategic direction is required alongside broader and more effective social insurance, much broader, much more effective, 
In Europe, it has to be on a transnational scale. There's no way around it. If the European societies of the periphery collapse, the populations will have to be dealt with by the European societies of the center. And I say, including, and in part of social insurance, a job guarantee in each citizen's home country, something we need in the United States as well, to eliminate the scourge of unemployment and allow people to do useful work, which gives them also the capacity of showing an employment record to private employers. This is the plainest common sense in the direction of major institutional reform going forward. If we are to make the choices necessary to deal with the existential threats, the nuclear threat and the climatic threat, with which I opened, any other approach, tolerant of inequality, bereft of public purpose, is a formula for violence. It's a formula for social disruption, for conflict within and between nations, for repression, and the loss of the freedoms that we continue to enjoy today. But I think we can see that practically everywhere they're under increasing threat. Polanyi, Carl Polanyi, understood the institutional underpinnings of the Great Transformation. The same and more, actually much more, by way of institutional change, creative thinking, a lack of dogma, a pragmatic uh, capacity to address the fundamental challenges, but also the enabling conditions that we face, is required of us and will be required of us in our uh, time. Thanks very much indeed.